Hey, it's Marshall here with SparkFun Engineering. Today, I'd like to talk to you about how I made this FLIR camera for general use in our department. For new users who might be watching, I'll be equating the engineering process to playing with Legos, but also talking about the circuits inside for the more advanced. A FLIR camera is an infrared camera that can show you the temperatures of things. FLIR cameras can tell you a lot about the world that you can't see with your naked eye. For instance, I've pre-chilled half of these Legos. The camera has a one-button operation for taking pictures, and we can see here that the picture has appeared in our directory. To me, engineering is figuring out how to make things, so I've got a really simple process here that generally fits all the requirements. First, identify your needs, then combine what you know and try making it, and then see if it fit your needs. If yes, then you're done, but if no, do some research and try making it again. If you get caught up in this loop for too long, you can always go back and redefine what you want. As an example, I'll apply this process to building a front end loader out of Legos. First, identify the needs. We'll need wheels, a tool, a place for an operator, and some controls. Now, try combining what we have. So we've got some wheels here. Let's start with that. But we're going to need something else to put these together. So we look around for other things to combine. This is an obvious solution here is to use a connector. And now we're getting somewhere. Uh, but the guy can't go on there straight away. And the bucket doesn't make any sense. We're going to need to build it up a little bit more. OK, here's the first iteration. It meets the needs, but isn't the best. To continue this product, we could go back and try different combinations, read the instructions, or get crazy and use Lego CAD programs. But instead, let's get serious and talk about what we need for the FLIR camera project. We'll need an image sensor, a viewfinder, shutter button, removable media, a quarter 20 mount for a tripod, maybe a fancy grip, and it will need to be mobile. With our needs identified, let's look at the parts we have. So we're gonna need some kind of a power. Let's get these batteries. One of those should do. For some of our functions, we might need some kind of a microcontroller, although these red boards might not be the solution. Here's a TNT, that should be easy. We could use that. The discretes kit and the capacitor kit have all sorts of good things you can combine. All right, so obviously we can't plug a battery straight into the pie. We're missing something. What we've got for solutions is some power cells. I've got regular boosters. Here's just a straight up boost converter. Can we take a battery and use a booster and then drive the pie? I'm not sure. Let's do the math. All right, so take a look at our system here. We're gonna have a Pi, we need some kind of a battery, and then something in the middle. So if we just use a booster, we connect that battery into the booster, that may allow us to run the Pi, but how are we gonna charge the battery? So here's the power cell. We'll see if this can solve the problem for us. So we know that the power cell has a port for a battery, an input, and an output. The output is 500 milliamps and five volts and the battery will work with our 3.7 volt LiPo. So is this enough current? Now is a good time to fit a few components together and measure how much power they actually consume. At this time, I also identified that I don't want to use the mounts on the screen as recommended, but to offset the Pi to get the USB ports close towards the edge. With the meter inserted in the circuit, the current measures to be 0.65 amps. But with all the bells and whistles attached, this will probably be closer to about 0.9 amps. Now that we know we need 900 milliamps, let's try combining two of these in parallel. We'll have another one over here. Join our inputs and join our outputs. Now each one can supply 500 milliamps and we should be able to get one amp out. But what happens if one of these goes dead? Then we have five volts on the output driven from a different source. All right, so let's just look at the output of these two boosters. If we use a diode in series, That'll let the current go out, but not back in again. So here are our output ports, and we can just put a diode in them. Now when one goes dead, we don't fear damaging it. We've got our discretes kit here. We've got some 4004 diodes. From the product page, we've got links to all the data sheets of this discrete part. So we check out our instantaneous forward current, instantaneous voltage drop. We notice that at 0.5 amps, we're seeing about 0.9 volts of drop. If we have 5.0 volts on the output, we're going to see 4.1 volts on the other side, which won't be enough for the Pi. Doing more research, we identify that there's another type of diode, a shot key. Shot keys are faster and also have a lower voltage drop. So from the data sheet, we've got a graph of forward current and forward voltage. At about half an amp, we're seeing about 0.5 volts drop. Let's insert these shot keys, and now we might expect 4.5 volts there. This is probably acceptable. 
We don't want to use the power supplies to supply current to the load because they're really just meant for charging. We're going to take our power supply, which also goes in, to charge the batteries, but redirect it to the output and diode or it. Now, either these two power supplies could work together to create the current we need, or we can plug it into the wall and that voltage will go through here. As we go, we realize we'd rather have the current go through here when we apply it from the wall. So we'll choose our 5.25 volt supply that comes with the Pi 3. This ensures that when the voltage from the supply is present, the current would much rather go through this diode than through these diodes from the 5 volt supplies. When we remove the adapter, of course, current will go back to running from the power cells. One more thing is that I'd like to prevent the batteries from running all the way down to zero. I'm going for easy here, so I'll use a simple solution. I'll just put switches on them. Now when we disconnect the switch, the batteries are completely out of the circuit. We'd like to measure the voltages on these batteries in the rail from Linux. So for the prototype, I've used the Teensy, which is really easy to use. But it kind of consumes a lot of current, so I'll be switching to the Pro Micro, which consumes a lot less. We'll also use this for the button interface. Both of these devices actually work as keyboards and serial devices to a computer, and that's the link we'll be relying on. So a quick explanation of what the microcontroller will do. This will be attached to the Linux by a USB. We'll have all of our buttons on it, an LED, and we'll also be measuring analog values using the ADC. In the description, I've got a link to a GitHub where I've got all the details for this build, including a full schematic that I've drawn up. The next time you see me, I'll have this completely polished up and I'll show you how to test an actual product with it. And as a thank you for watching, I'm gonna peel this sticky off for you. <laughs> Ready? Go ahead. Then what? Thank you. Thanks for watching. Ha <laughs> ha